Well, that's the conspiracy theorist sort of why the smear campaign is so effective. Right. Is because, and now post COVID, right, it's like the alt right line of thinking is that the. That's right. Um, the virus isn't real. Any COVID skepticism is tantamount to neo-fascist sentiment, basically. Yeah, that's right. Um, Talk about irony. We are now living uh, in the in the darkening shadow of, of a totalitarianism, the likes of which the world has never seen. And it's happening in the name of anti-fascism. You know, Trump has played a, a crucial role in this, you know, probably unwittingly because I don't think he's the sharpest think he's tool in the box. played into their hand, yeah. Yeah, because um, everybody has long since, not everybody, but liberals, progressives have long since bought the equation of Trump-Hitler. I think Trump is Hitler, mm-hmm. right? Which is ridiculous if you know anything about either one of them. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> Trump is Hitler and therefore, you know, um, anyone who says anything that sounds like something he would say is like a proud boy, mm-hmm. is a supporter of his, is a fascist. I, I've had friends, some of the smartest people I know, I've known them for years and years. One guy in particular whose work I've promoted, uh, worked closely with him in the election integrity movement, responded to something I sent my listserv, which was about uh, the lockdowns, you know, and didn't even read what I sent. He just read my little preface. He said, how does it feel to be on the same side as the AK-47 or worse, toting thugs? He goes off on this tirade. This was insane. I ask myself (laughs) this question all the time. Yeah. Yeah, right. I get up every morning. Yeah, it feels, that doesn't feel that good. Oh, well. No, no, I mean. But, but that's, you know, honestly, this this is useful because propaganda appeals to the lizard brain. It doesn't mm-hmm. matter how smart you are or how well-educated. If your buttons have been pushed successfully, if you're sufficiently terrorized, if you're in a panic. If you're living in constant fear of a virus. <laughs> constant fear of a virus, and you see Trump as, as, as a virus, you know, Trump yeah. is this presidential virus. Um, you, you, first of all, you're going to want to believe what the authorities you trust tell you. Mm-hmm. See, that's why these terror campaigns are so bad for democracy, is they make people comply. Mm-hmm. So people trust Dr. Fauci, which mm-hmm. if they knew anything about his background, they would never do. They trust Bill Gates, right. which is mind-boggling to me, you know. Yeah. Uh, and they will follow everything he says, even if it differs from what he'd said a month ago, you know. They'll just say, oh, yes, we have to listen to him because he's not Trump and he disagrees with Trump. Well, the Fauci worship, the Fauci t-shirts, the yeah. Cuomo-sexuals, the like. <laughs> I don't know why we haven't gotten into the Fauci merch game, really. <laughs> Um, oh, I was I was just going down actually because I couldn't sleep last night and I went down like a kind of oral history of AIDS and um, you know I, I said this on the pod before but Larry Kramer famously said you know Fauci shouldn't be honored at a dinner he should be thrown in prison for his <laughs> bungling of the AIDS virus and you see how like with the AIDS virus they were making many of the mis- same mistakes that we're making now and I think the the bigger issue right is that people have a very short historic memory which is probably flattened even more so because of the internet and social media um but to that point you i i noticed when i was googling you that you wrote an introduction to edward bernays's propaganda i did and we now know that you know guys like bernays and his contemporary walter lippman were the kind of original architects of public opinion management i'm curious how you think propaganda has changed since then and then since, like, Noam Chomsky published Manufacturing Consent. You know, Noam Chomsky, who has now become himself a kind of avid propagandist. Of, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's kind of a sad story. Well, how has it changed? Um, it, it, it has changed in its um, vastly greater sophistication and in the fact that it has benefited from the real sort of uh, study the sort of scientific study of psychological manipulation that was carried out not not just by the CIA. I mean, MK Ultra, all those programs were really uh, mind control programs. But prior to their work, the Nazis had engaged in 
this kind of study under Dr. Goebbels, and a lot of those guys were brought over here, you know, mm. as part of Operation Paperclip, and, the, you know, those who didn't go to work at NASA or the Pentagon would often go to work, uh, you know, in universities and stuff um, on psychological warfare and that kind of thing. So, so it has changed in that it's become more sophisticated, and the technological apparatus on which it's based, I think, is even more hypnotic and arresting than previous media, you know, so mm-hmm. we're all online. I mean, the Internet, on the one hand, is a great resource, or I should say has been a great resource for those interested in counter-narratives. I've been saying this for years, that younger people who are used to the Internet are not as reverent towards the New York Times and not as freaked out by uh, Mm -hmm. the conspiracy theory meme and are more receptive because for a couple of decades now, the other side of the story has been available just to click away. Even as we speak, that's changing because so much stuff is being deleted and blocked, um, Mm -hmm. flagged as false. Right. And Google has, and Facebook, et cetera, have a great deal to do with this, you know. Uh, so as the Internet has become more and more enthralled to a few private companies, uh, we see the Internet go the way of the previous media, which already were excessively dominated by like six multinationals. So all, all that has meant that it's changed since Bernays' day, but it is fundamentally the same. And and what I have discovered, to my horror, all this year, is that, generally speaking, humankind has not progressed one centimeter since the days when people uh, flocked to the recruiting stations to go fight the Hun. It, it, there's no difference. And indeed, you know, and Chomsky made this very good point in the 60s, you know, when he was really lucid, <laughs> um, that it's often the most educated people who are the most susceptible to propaganda. You know, you'd think it'd be different. This isn't to say that the uneducated aren't susceptible. They are. But a certain kind of establishment narrative mm-hmm. yeah. is more compelling to people who've been to university, and especially if they have advanced degrees, you know, because... Well, they're invested in the system. They're invested yeah. in the system. And also, I want to tell you about a book. I'm in the middle of it now. Uh, it's really a terrific book. Yeah, give us your bibliography. <laughs> sure. It's called Disciplined Minds mm. by a guy named Jeff Schmidt. Mm-hmm. He, the guy got a PhD in physics, but um, he, he, it's more of a sociological discussion of why, how, how the professions, all of them, the law, medicine, uh, academia, the media, how they all shape the people who join them mainly through the process of professional training. People go into these fields idealistically with high expectations for what they can accomplish, and that has to be kind of slowly battered out of you (laughs) so that you end up posing no threat to the system, you know, raising no serious questions about the status quo or the power structure. And that's why people can work for the Times and the networks and the rest of them and see things in a certain way and have that conspiracy theory reflex really primed, you know? Right. Yeah. Well, because it would, sorry. Well, because it would call into question all of the, the structures of reality that they prop themselves up on and are invested in. Exactly. That's right. I mean, they are invested both financially and psychologically. What, yeah, what do you think is the more important motivation, the financial or the psychological one? Like the the uh, securing the bag or maintaining your defense mechanism? That's something I, I, I think about a lot. Well, I, I, I think it's impossible to separate the two. They're, they're intimately connected, you know. Mm. You, you, you can't face yourself making the fairly decent salary you make if you if you don't believe in what you're doing i mean if you tried to do that the self-loathing would be sort of overwhelming right. you know uh upton sinclair said something like this 
Upton Sinclair said Black Lives Matter. <laughs> um, yeah, build, no, but he I, said Build Back Better. But he said, <laughs> yeah, but I think Lip, um, Lipman made this point regarding journalists that they're actually way more gullible than the uh, general public. And we, I mean, we had Matt Taibbi on a couple of weeks ago. Um, and one of the, the revelations in his book, Hey INC, was that um, the kind of uh, joint U.S. British intelligence ghouls who are orchestrating the war on terror and the, the first launch into kind of Iraq um, expected the public to fall in line way quicker than the professional media. And it turned out that it was actually the other way around. Right. And there were, you know, public protests everywhere because nobody kind of in the general public bought the WMD narrative. That's right. Yeah. So that, I mean, that was an int- but you know, it's interesting that they didn't see that, but people kind of a generation, two generations before that absolutely clocked it. Yeah, well, that's true. The, 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 those were the biggest protests up to that point in, mm-hmm. in world history, actually they swept the gl- globe. And if you go back and look at the times as coverage, it's very interesting to see that they almost don't mention the, the, the protests in this yeah. country. They talk about them elsewhere, you know. Yeah, the journalists, I mean, the, the relations between the CIA and journalism are, are really worth study. We look at that in uh, my propaganda course. Yeah. You know, they've, they've been working on journalists in America since their formation in 1947. But the relations between the power players and the press predate that development, you know, because the press was largely owned by um, predatory players, you know, the newspapers and most of the magazines, and the press was dominated by its big advertisers. Mm -hmm. So, for example, I mean, we all know about the dangers of smoking, but for decades the press ignored that because they were so dependent on revenues from that industry. 